You know, a, a few weeks ago, at the start of this present pandemic, my thoughts kept returning to a previous generation, uh, our grandparents' generation. And I thought about how they faced a worldwide crisis that was much worse than the one we face now. I mean, during the Second World War, there were 80 million people died and it went on for six years. Now, during that six years, people suffered incredible hardships, especially if you lived in a country maybe that was being bombed. I remember as a child being fascinated by a, a series that was on the television. I don't know if you remember it, The World at War. Do you remember that documentary series? And uh, it was made in Britain, and so a lot of it focused on the rationing and the hardships that people went through there uh, during the war. The government there sought to mobilize the whole country through sacrificial living uh, to achieve victory. And that meant, therefore, that for six years, nearly every government announcement in Britain was an instruction of some sort as to what people needed to do and keep doing if victory would be reached. So for six years, they only heard announcements on what they needed to do in order to become victorious. But then one day, a different announcement came, one that was so different that it transformed the whole nation. And this Friday will actually mark 75 years to the day since that announcement. The announcement that the war in Europe was finally over. Now, at that announcement, a great celebration began. For a few days, the whole nation just sang and danced and probably drank quite a lot and just gave thanks. Now, of all the tens of thousands of announcements and instructions that had been given over those six years, none of them had had that effect. None of them caused such an outbreak of joy. And that's because there was a profound difference between all of them and the announcement made on May the 8th, 1945. Now here's the difference. For six years, every government message to the people was one of instruction, a message about what they needed to do in order to become victorious. All those announcements effectively said the same thing. In order for you to become, this is what needs to be done. But the message that started the party was different. It did not say, in order for you to become, this is what needs to be done. It said, this is who you are because of what has been done. Today, you are victorious. Today, you are free because of what has been done. Now listen to how Paul described the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the Romans. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's Romans 8, 16. You see, good news is always the news of what is, not what might be. All the other government announcements down those six years of the war, they spoke of a life in the future, a life that people should live for. But that announcement on May the 8th spoke of a different life, not a life in the future that people should live for, but a life today that people could now live from, could live in today. And millions immediately began to live in that new life, in the joy of it, in the peace of it, in the freedom of it, because they believed the announcement. Now, over the last few weeks, we have seen that the gospel is not the message of what will be if you first, but the declaration, the announcement of what is because he first. And that's why the gospel has the power to release people into a new life, because it is not saying in order for you to become, this is what needs to be done. Such an announcement can only leave you putting your trust in what you have to do. In other words, it leaves you believing in yourself. The gospel is an announcement that says, this is who you are because of what has been done. To believe in that announcement is to believe in what has been done. That is to believe in Christ. You see, the gospel is not mere instruction. It is news, good news. But it is, in fact, good news on such a seismic scale, good news of something so wonderful that just like that announcement in 1945, it has the power to release people into a new life. The gospel empowers people to live a new type of life, a life in peace, in victory, in freedom, a life in Christ. And all they have to do to begin this new life is to believe the news. And even the faith to believe comes in the message. That's why Paul said he determined to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified, because he discovered that when people hear the gospel as the news 
of what has been done for them. Christ has given his life. Rather than advice on what they should do for God, they are empowered by that news to live from and live in what has been done for them. Christ's given life. In other words, the message itself empowers people to live a new life. Listen to how Paul said that to the Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So Paul is saying the gospel is the power of God to save. And last week we saw how the gospel is the power of God to save. It is the power of God because the power of God is his spirit. And God's spirit rests on, anoints the truth of what is, not what might be. The spirit witnesses with the truth of what is because of what Christ did. In other words, the Holy Spirit always points us to Christ and his finished work, not to us and our unfinished works, for he knows our faith can rest on Christ, but not on ourselves. True gospel preaching leaves your faith on Christ and his sinless life, not on you and your sinning less life. And two weeks ago, we saw that because God's Spirit speaks of what is, he speaks to us as a father would, one who sees who we are and speaks to us as who we are. The Spirit doesn't see us and so doesn't speak to us as a manager or an employer would, for they, being productivity focused, can't help always speaking to us about what we should do in order to become who we should be, someone better, someone more productive for God. Notice the gospel speaks of life in God, whereas religion tends to speak of life for God. So because the Spirit testifies to what is, not what might be, He always speaks to us as who we are, not who we could be. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Many of us have actually thought of prophecy, uh, the speaking of the Spirit, primarily in terms of the Spirit speaking of things that are to come, foretelling. But in reality, heaven's reality, the Holy Spirit is speaking of things which are true. He is forth telling. He is telling forth what is in order that it be believed so that then the truth, the reality heaven sees is seen on the earth. Let me give you an example of that. Heaven saw Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians as God's chosen vessel to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But no one on the earth saw that heavenly reality, least of all Saul. When the Holy Spirit told the disciple in Damascus called Ananias to go and pray for Saul, Ananias basically replied, you've got to be joking. Let me tell you, Lord, who this man is. He is the one who is harming your church. But the Holy Spirit replied in effect, no, Ananias, let me tell you who he is. He is my chosen instrument to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. That is who he is. That's Acts 9 verse 15. You see, the Holy Spirit told Ananias of what is, so that in believing in what is, God's reality, Ananias could carry what is, God's reality, into the earth. And that is exactly what he did in the power of the Spirit, in the power of what is true in God. Ananias walked up to his enemy, Saul, placed his hand on him, and the first word out of his mouth was, brother. Wow, heaven's reality manifesting on the earth. Brother Saul, here is who God declares you to be. And in that declaration of what is, that declaration of God's reality came the power of the Holy Spirit. And something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Only this time he saw things totally differently for he saw himself as God saw him. And from that point, he lived the life God always saw him living, the life of a son of God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, those who see the reality the Spirit sees, these live as the sons of God. That's Romans 8, 14. So the Gospel and the Spirit are in total agreement. They both speak of what is, that we may believe and live in what is, God's given life, communion with the Father through faith in Christ. You see, fear comes from doubt and relates to the future. We fear what may or may not happen. The Holy Spirit doesn't cause us to live in doubt or fear because he does not speak to us of who we may be, but of who we are. Listen to Romans again, Romans 8, 15 and 16. 
The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. In other words, the Spirit speaks of who we are because of what has been done for us. Can you see that is like the announcement of the end of the war? It is not the announcement of who you could be, but of who you are because of what has been done for you. And it has the same effect. The believing of that news imparts the power to live in that new reality, the reality of who you now are because of what has been done for you. You don't have to go back to working harder in the hope that you may be free one day. If you believe the announcement, you can start to live in your new freedom, your new life, your hidden with Christ and God life immediately because the Spirit is present to enable you to live as a child of God. How? By testifying to your Spirit that you are a child of God. Now, yes, there follows a journey to grow up into this life, what Ephesians calls growing up into Christ. But believer, you cannot grow up in a life unless you have already been birthed into that life. The gospel, the news of God's salvation, is not merely about being in heaven one day. It is about being in Christ today. In Christ, you're not becoming a new creation. You are declared to already be one. In Christ, old things are not passing away and new things on the way. In Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You see, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, not will be one day, but are today. The gospel opens our eyes to see ourselves as God sees us because it gives us light to see by. We can see ourselves in the light of what God has done for us, reconciled us to himself, welcomed us into his joy. You see, being who God has made us to be starts with seeing who God has made us to be. Paul said, we declare this message that God has reconciled the world to himself in order that we may implore people on God's behalf to be who he sees them to be. We implore them, he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.20, be reconciled to God. The announcement is of what God has done, but you can't live in what God has done if you won't believe the message. You know, the world lived in peace after 1945 because they believed the announcement of what had been accomplished. They believed the announcement, it is finished. However, there was one Japanese soldier, at least, who refused to believe the announcement, it is finished, and he could not live in peace. In fact, he fought on for years, launching attacks from a hiding place deep in the jungle. I believe it was in the Philippines. You know, at first, he could not believe in the peace provided because he had not heard the announcement. But in later years, he still could not live in the peace provided because he refused to believe the announcement. Now, we can do nothing about people refusing to believe the announcement, but we can do something about people who have never heard the announcement. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 10:14 and 15. How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Oh, what a wonderful description of the gospel. Good news of good things. It is good news of good things because it is the announcement of the good things God has done, not the good things you need to do. That's why it's good news, not good advice. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a house with three brothers and three sisters and uh, with seven children to look after and trying to help my father run a business, it got to the stage where my dad persuaded my mother to hire a lady to come in to help out with a bit of housekeeping once a week. Now, mum resisted this for so long, but eventually she agreed to have this lady, she was called Marjorie, come in every Wednesday morning. Do you know what my mum did every Tuesday night to prepare for Marjorie coming in to clean the house? I think if you don't know, men ask your wives, they'll tell you what she did. <laughs> My mum cleaned the whole house before Marjorie got there. Do you know a big reason why many, many people in my community and yours won't be going to church even when the doors reopen again? Because they think they need to get their lives cleaned up before they come. 
If folk out there think they have to change, have to reach a certain level of cleanliness before God will accept them, the saddest thing about that is that they got that idea from Christians. Somehow, over 2,000 years, we have managed to take a message that said, receive God's acceptance of you in Christ and be changed, and replace it with one that says, you need to change in order for God to accept you. The gospel declares again and again, over and over, of God's love for us first. The Apostle John said it like this, we only love him because he first loved us. Now, as we saw in previous weeks, to talk like that, to talk about being hidden with Christ and God, sounds foolishness to the natural mind, to the mind set only on what our natural senses tell us. Because look around us, especially today, we're surrounded by problems, by tragedy, by grief. But what the Bible tells us is there are two ways of seeing. You can see by your natural understanding, by your natural senses, or you can see by the Spirit to see what God sees. That's why the prophet Elisha, on being surrounded by a vast enemy army, he could pray for his fearful servant. Lord, open his eyes. And when the servant looked with eyes open to the reality of the spirit, he saw that it was the enemy who was surrounded by a vast heavenly army. Colossians 3 declares it is God's will for every believer to live with their minds set in the heavenly realm. In other words, to live from, see from, speak from their life hidden with Christ in God. Paul begins that passage with these words. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. Well, church, have we or have we not been raised with Christ? Do you know right now the greatest hindrance to the kingdom of God on the earth is not God's hesitation to pour out his spirit. It is the church's hesitation to enter into all that has been given in Christ because our thinking, our theology, so shackles God's giving to our performance that we have tied ourselves to the earthly realm instead of living boldly from the heavenly realm of communion with our Father. Now you may say, Phelan, where does it say that in the Bible? Right in plain sight, in the most well-known in the world of all Jesus' parables. His account in Luke 15 of two sons living with a father they never knew. It is an account of two sons being invited to enter into the joy of their father, his joy over them, his view and opinion of them. Uh, that's the Greek word doxa, his glory. In fact, it is actually the third of three parables in that chapter, one after the other, that each end with the same invitation. Rejoice with me. Jesus puts those words in the mouth of the shepherd who has found his lost sheep, the widow who has found her lost coin, and the father who has found his lost son, because he is telling us of the invitation of the Father to all who will enter into his joy. Rejoice with me, for what was lost is found. Now, if you don't want to admit you're lost without him, then you are refusing to admit yourself to a life where you are found with him. But if you know that you have been found, you should not hesitate any longer to accept the Father's invitation to enter into his joy. But Jesus tells us that one son did because he could not see how much he had already been given. Now, if you remember the end of the story, the younger son, the prodigal, he's entered into the joy of the Father, the party's in full swing, but the elder brother is still standing outside and anger is preventing him from entering into, from living in his father's joy. Why is he so angry? Well, he's just discovered that his father doesn't agree with his theology, his beliefs about how his father should act. And there are lots of sons of God out there just like him. You can always recognize them by their anger. They're angry at everyone, but especially their brothers, especially the household of God. They're angry because they've been waiting for years for something that doesn't seem to have happened yet. They're still waiting for the Father to celebrate them, to bless them with the success that they feel their sacrifices for Him deserve. So when they see the Father's blessing on those who don't appear to be living sacrificial lives, who in fact, in their opinion, are much more sinful than they are, they get angry. They don't know it yet, but where they're thinking, their theology, and the fathers have parted company 
is over that little word, deserve. They want their father's blessing, his joy, to be about what they have done. But their father's joy and blessing is not about what we have done. It is about who he is. You see, he is a father who loves us so much that his only desire is for us to know how much so that we can share in his joy. Jesus told us in that parable of the prodigal son that the father never asked either son to earn his blessing, but in fact divided his living, his life, his bios between them before either had a record, good or bad, to present to him. You see, this is who he is. He is the father whose love for us, whose joy for us was never shackled to our performance. When in your mind, your thinking, your theology, you shackle God's love for you to your performance, what you have done is shackle yourself, chain yourself to your own record. The father had to go out to the elder brother because that son couldn't leave his fields to come in. He couldn't disconnect himself from his record. Here's the gospel. Christ disconnected you from your record at the cross in order that you could enter into the joy of the Father over you, a joy that never saw you as what you did and never called you after your works, but according to his grace and purpose given to you in Christ before the foundation of the world. You remember we looked at that last week, 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Far from not celebrating you, God's party over you started a long time ago. He's not the one preventing you from entering into his joy. It's the fact that you have shackled yourself Change yourself, believer, to your do-it-yourself, save-yourself life that is estranging you from the joy of the Father. You and I are the ones who distance ourselves from Him every time we turn away from Christ and Him crucified as the truth about how much He loves us and instead point to our lives and insist on believing that the things we have done should be the measure of His love for us. The elder brother estranged himself. You could say he socially distanced himself from the house of the father, from knowing his father and his father's love and joy, his father's celebration over him. You know, right now on the earth, we know social distancing has separated families and communities in order that they don't catch something that might kill them. But you know, in the realm of the spirit, child of God, when you socially distance yourself from the mind of God by insisting on shackling yourself to your life's work, you miss catching something that's going to strengthen you, not kill you, the joy of the Father over you. Paul warned the Galatians, when believers start to try and earn the grace of God, they estrange themselves. They socially distance themselves from the grace and the power of God. In great compassion, the father came out from the party and he came down into the fields and he declared the truth to his elder son. And I love declaring these words because a few years ago, they changed my life. The father said, son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. Have you ever noticed that story appears unfinished? Jesus does not tell us if the elder brother entered into the father's celebration or not whether he believed the Father or not, when the Father said, you're always with me and all I have is yours. Why didn't Jesus tell us? Why didn't he finish the story? Perhaps because the story was not his to finish. It is for each of us to finish this story. It's for the church to finish. So church, what's it gonna be? Do we believe the Father when he says that we are in constant communion with him and all that he has is ours? Or shall we continue to live like mere men, working our way into God's good books in the hope that one day he will make up his mind in our favor and pour out his blessing? Shall we continue in all our religious anger and frustration with the world and then wonder why it is that no one wants to meet the Father we believe in? If the Father you believe in never appears yet to have blessed you in the way that you think your sacrifices have deserved, you need to go back and take a look again at Christ and Him crucified and ask God's Spirit to show you how much He gave you right there and then before you had any record to present. And I believe the Holy Spirit will bring you to the same conclusion He brought the Apostle Paul to in Romans 8.32. He who did not spare His own Son but delivered Him over for us all how will he not also with him give us all things freely? You see, when the Father gives us Christ, 
He gave us everything he had to give so that we could come out of the fields of religion, come out of a world that is measuring us to death and come into what cannot be measured, the love and joy of the Father over you and I. To see this way is to see by the Spirit. And God has given us his Holy Spirit so that we may live in the power of God's Spirit by living, seeing our lives as the Spirit sees us. He doesn't see us as the Father's slaves who have to earn his blessing. He sees us as the Father's sons from whom he has withheld no good thing. And when we start to see like that, to see by the Spirit, then we can live content in the day we're in. Even when nothing about us, nothing about our circumstances seems to say that God has blessed us because we're no longer waiting for our circumstances to improve, to know our Father's approval because by the Spirit, we have already entered into our Father's approval. And we're now living from our Spirit, which is a house of music and dancing. You know, I believe that any believer who needs guilt or shame or the fear of punishment to motivate them to live a godly life is not living in the power of the Spirit. If I, as a minister, try and manipulate people to give money or resources or time to the church by trying to make them feel guilty, that is simply an admission that I have failed to raise up a people who are living by the Spirit, a people who bear in their lives the most generous and caring life in the world, the life of a perfectly loved son. If I have to go back to using the law on Christians, well, if you'll only do this for God, then he'll do that for you. That is an admission that I have not been ministering a gospel that allows believers to grow up, to mature into sonship, to enter into all that has been given for them. Because the only gospel that allows Christians to grow up into generous, loving, confident, fearless children is a gospel that holds up before them a generous, loving, confident, fearless father. A father who's not afraid of the mess of our lives because he is the one who has left his dwelling and ran toward us and stretched out his arms on that cross and buried us and our mess in himself 2,000 years ago. So I leave before you today the Father's invitation. Rejoice with me. Enter into the reality of what has been done for you and given to you. Admit the truth and admit yourself into the presence of the Father in which there is a joy that this world can no longer distance you from. Admit that you are lost without him. Then look to the cross and see his arms open out for you. For the moment you will believe on Christ as your way into the Father's house, then you no longer have to live as lost without him. You can live as found with him and from there begin to grow in the strength of his joy over you. Praise the Lord. God bless you.